Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Longinusa, welcoming you to another edition of Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, the show where industry leaders, golf professionals, and legends all come and discuss the great game we love so much. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our host to tell us who's next on the tee. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe LaGenusa. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me again this morning on Next on the Tee. I am your host, Chris Mascaro, and this morning we're going to have so much fun. I have three great guests that I can't wait to share with you. First up is going to be Dave Harner. Dave is the director of golf operations at one of my favorite resorts anywhere on the planet, and that's the French Lick Resort. You've heard me talking about how great the French Lick Resort is now for the last several months, and I'm so excited to have Dave back with me on the show. They hosted this year's Senior PGA Tour Championship, won by Colin Montgomery on their peak die course. And now they are set to host the LPGA Legends Championship with some of the biggest names in the history of golf. In fact, let's hear a word about that great event. Inkster, Rinker, Bradley, Stephen, Blaylock. Our rich golf history comes alive once again as the legends of the LPGA return to French Lick Resort August 28th through 30th. The Legends Championship, presented by Old National Bank, benefiting Riley Hospital for Children. See the greats of ladies' golf take on the gorgeous Pete Dye course in a fun and relaxed setting. Learn more about the Legends Championship presented by Old National Bank, August 28th through the 30th at FrenchLick.com. So that's going to be such a great event, played on the Pete Dye course. What a year Pete's had, right, with the major golf uh, this season. The U.S. Open played on a Pete Dye course. The Senior PGA played at the French Lick Resort on a Pete Dye course. PGA Championship recently, right, at uh, Whistling Straits on a Pete Dye course. And now the Ladies Legends Championship, all on Pete Dye Golf Courses. So good for you, Pete. We're going to talk about all that and so much more when Dave joins me here in just a few moments. Following Dave today is going to be legendary broadcaster Ben Wright. I am I always enjoy getting to spend some time listening to Mr. Wright sharing his thoughts, insights, and stories with us from his 50-some-odd years around the game of golf. We'll reflect back, reflect back on the Open Championship and last week's PGA Championship. Plus, we'll get his thoughts on the future of the PGA Tour with the 20-somethings, right? Jordan Spieth, Rory McIlroy, you know, Jason Day, and so many more great young players. Uh, Mr. Wright is going to be with me about 25 minutes from now. Then we'll wrap up the show with our Ask Sean segment with 2003 PGA champion Sean McKeel. Sean played in last week's PGA championship at, at Whistling Straits, which was also the venue back in 2004 when Sean was the defending champion. So we'll get his thoughts about this year's event, how different it played from when he was the defending champion 10 years ago. Plus, he'll be answering more of your questions when he joins me about 40 minutes from now. So it's going to be another great show today, folks, and I'm so glad that you're here to take the journey with me. Next on the T is brought to you today by our friends over at Seymour Putters. Let's get things rolling by hearing a word from our friends over there. Golfers, has this happened to you? Great drive. Perfect second shot on the green. Only the three or even four putt. Shaking your head all the way back to the cart. I have good news. Help is on the way with the Seymour Putter. The Seymour Putter Company patented RST technology sets up the putter perfectly every time using a visible gun sight on the top line. Genius! It's like locking radar onto the target. In this case, the golf hole. Putting the golfer in perfect position to make a reliable and consistent stroke. The 1999 U.S. Open, 2007 Masters, and 2015 British Open champions all used, you guessed it, the Seymour Putter. So if you're ready to make more putts, take strokes off your game, log on to Seymour.com. That's S-E-E-M-O-R-E.com and put a Seymour Putter in your bag today. Yeah, like Joe said, check out their rifle scope technology that helped win now three majors and 36 tour events and counting because this year's men's British Open champion was using a Seymour putter. And it's going to help you make more putts, too. I know it's helping me. Check them out online at Seymour.com. That's S-E-E-M-O-R-E.com and get one in your bag. You're going to be very glad you did. We are also sponsored by the folks over at the French Lick Resort in French Lick, Indiana. Folks, 
as I mentioned a moment ago, and you've you know heard me talk about over the last several months, you want to talk about a spectacular place to go, check out FrenchLick.com. What a beautiful resort. I had the privilege of taking my family there in June, and we're already looking forward to going back as soon as possible. The resort is historic and fantastic. It's got wonderful gardens in the back and a huge, relaxing rocking chair porch on the front. And the golf, oh my folks, the golf. The Pete Dye course is kept in championship condition year-round, and they could be ready to host a major championship at a moment's notice. So if you've always wondered what it would be like to play in a major, well, now you can do it by going to play the Pete Dye course there at the French Lick Resort. They also have a Donald Ross design course, which is also fantastic. It's the site of Walter Hagen's PGA Championship victory back in 1924. They've also got the Valley Lynx course on property that dates back to 1907. So the French Lick Resort needs to be on your list of places to stay and play. For more information and to book your stay, go to FrenchLick.com. I also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Allen Edmonds, maker of top quality made in the USA shoes. Folks, the shoes of great leaders from the Oval Office to corner offices to stage and screen and promising cubicles all around the country are part of what make people successful. The right footwear is important on the carpets and the hardwood floors of our global economy. Get it right with made in the USA quality and value from Allen Edmonds. Allen Edmonds is an American original. They've been making shoes right here in the United States and Wisconsin since 1922. Check them out online at allenedmonds.com. And I want to get today's show kicked off right like we do every single week here on Next on the T, and that's by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military and listening in around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. We want to thank all of you for your daily sacrifices and for what you do every day to keep the rest of us safe. We also want to thank our veterans for all you've done for us over the years. We truly appreciate everything our military personnel do to preserve the freedoms and the liberties that we all have. It's through your strength and your efforts that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz and all the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It's an honor for us to have Next on the T be a part of your network. You can find our show by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. And I also want to remind our veterans out there, be sure to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. It's a great site with news and articles and a wealth of information designed specifically for our veterans out there that I'm sure you're going to find both interesting and beneficial. Again, please go to globalvoiceforveterans.org. You're going to be glad you did. Great site. We also want to thank everyone listening in across the Internet on wonderful sites like iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, and Blog Talk Radio as well. Plus, if someone's dragging you out to the mall or they're dragging you to the grocery store, you're just simply tired of the same old, same old on your commute, download the Player.fm or Stitcher app on your smartphone and take us with you everywhere you go. Let us give you something fun to focus on while you're out and about. All right, folks. Now joining me on the Seymour Putters guest line is Dave Harner. Dave is the director of golf operations, like you heard me say a moment ago, one of the most gorgeous facilities you'll find anywhere on the planet, the French Lick Resort, which was the site of this year's Senior PGA Championship. They're also getting ready to host the LPGA's Legends Championship here this next coming week. Folks, if you're not f- uh, familiar with this facility, you need to go check it out online. Go to frenchlick.com forward slash golf. It's absolutely spectacular. Like I say, they have three courses, one each designed by Pete Dye, Donald Ross, and Tom Bendelow. Playing those courses has to be on your bucket list. When you look at them online, you're going to understand why you hear me say that every single week now. Let me give you a little more background on Dave. He was named the 2012 Indiana PGA Professional of the Year. He has been named Indiana PGA Resort Merchandiser of the Year three times, and I'm very excited to have him back with me and next on the tee this morning. Hey, Dave, how are you, my friend? Hey, doing great, uh, Chris. How are you this morning? Uh, fantastic. Thank you. Dave, let's let's start off by talking about the, the event you guys have coming up next week, the LPGA Legends event. Talk about uh, the folks that uh, you know we're going to get to see because uh, you've got uh, some of the greatest names in the history of the LPGA going to be there. You know, the Legends event um, is really special to us. We got on board with them in 2013. This will be our third year. Um, Old National Bank is our presenting sponsor, and uh, all proceeds from this event go to the Riley Children's Foundation, which is a children's hospital that affects a lot of kids in uh, in our region. So we're happy to uh, to use this event as a fundraiser for Riley. And uh, 
you know, this is sort of a, a festive event. Uh, the senior PGA was very special to us, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime to get a host a, a major PGA event. But uh, from a spectator standpoint, from a pro-am participant standpoint, from a sponsor standpoint, uh, the legends are just a, a blast. These ladies um, are great to interact with. Um, full access, full-out access. They have no gallery ropes. You know, the fans are right there. And they spend all the time with you that they can. So it's it's a special event. I I can give you uh, kind of a recap of the field, and you'll see that um, some of the greatest ever to play women's golf are, are in this field. I think there are 400 LPGA Tour wins represented and 70 LPGA Major Championships represented in the field. Wow. Yeah, please, you know, run down the list of some of the ladies that uh, that are going to be there. I think, you know, like you say, some of the greatest players in the history of the LPGA. So, you know, what are a whistle? Who are some of the folks that are going to be playing there? Well, Susie Burning will be here. I believe she was a two-time U.S. Women's Open champion. Uh, Jane Blaylock, of course, 30-time winner on the LPGA Tour. Pat Bradley, um, uh, who's a great player, I think up in the 30 to 40 LPGA wins. Donna Capone, Joanne Carner. Don Co. Jones, Elaine Crosby, Laura Davies is coming over. Uh, of course, she was recently inducted into the World Golf Hall of Fame. Right. Uh, Judy Dickinson, um, Jane Geddes, Shelley Hamlin, Sandra Haney, Carolyn Hill, Pat Hurst, and this year making her debut in the event, Julie Inkster, um, will be coming by to play with us for, for the uh, 2015 event. Um, Rosie Jones will be here. Uh, Michelle McGann, Martha Noss. Anne Marie Polly, Sandra Palmer, Cindy Rarick, Michelle Redmond, Laurie Rinker, our 2014 champion, Jan Stevenson, Chris Cheddar, uh, just to name a few. Yeah, no, that's a that's an outstanding field, and you know one of the things that strikes me, and Dave, you mentioned it a moment ago, is the the access that fans will have to to these uh, these great players. Uh, you know, you mentioned no ropes in between, so you know, talk about the interaction and the access that uh, the fans get to have by you know coming out to be a part of the event, not only you know during the week and as you you know lead up to the two rounds over the weekend, but talk about that you know that level of access. That's very rare. I think the the big thing about this event is it actually begins on Thursday night at the pro am pairings party where the the players meet their uh, their teams for the pro am and spend the evening uh, telling stories and you know being part of the festivities. Uh, then on Friday the pro am we have actually two pro ams this year. We have an eight o'clock start and a one thirty start because of the popularity of the event. We had to to double up. Then wow. on Friday night, something really special. We have the LPGA Legends Hall of Fame here at the West Baden Springs Hotel. And um, on Friday night, we'll have our annual Champions Dinner and our Hall of Fame induction. This year's inductees are uh, Joanne Carner and Rosie Jones. And they join um, Jan Stevenson, Kathy Whitworth, Jane Blaylock, and Nancy Lopez as members of the Hall of Fame. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, and, and Dave... You know, one of the things that uh, that you know that jumps out at out at me, and you know, I was I was very fortunate to be able to play the Pete Dye course back in June, thanks to all you you wonderful folks. And and uh, one of the things that you talked to me about with that with that golf course is it is in championship condition. It was in championship condition then, and it's kept in championship condition you know year round. So you know, like I like I mentioned you know a moment ago for for those folks you know out there that uh, have always wondered what it would be like to play you know, in a major, play on a major championship golf course. Well, you can do that out there at the Pete Dye course year round. Talk about, talk about the condition and the reputation that you have built for that golf course. Of course, you know, hats off to Russ Apple, our superintendent and his team. They, uh, they go above and beyond on a daily basis to be sure that our guests get to receive that championship experience. You know, we're all about, um, not just around the golf where you drive up, your clubs come out of the trunk, you play and you leave. It's more of an all day experience where you, you know, the, the golf's unlimited. Once you pay the fee, uh, you know, the, the lunch experience is great out on the back patio. We've got a great practice practice facility. So it's really a day of golf, uh, in the, the broadest sense. And Dave, for, for the listeners who haven't joined us in the past. Talk about the genesis and history of that golf course. It's one that Pete Dye had originally said couldn't be built on that piece of land, right? Yeah, Pete, um, you know, Pete came late to the process. We had talked to a lot of other um, architects, a lot of other people about 
building a course here. And initially, this course was going to be a supplement to the Donald Ross course, which is, a, by the way, a great golf course. It's an old school, uh, you know, early 1900s uh, right. build, and it's it's uh, it's a unique experience in its own. But we we initially thought we were building a course just to supplement that, and uh, we went through probably eight or ten architects and uh, one day mr ferguson got a call from alice die and she said i want to know if you're going to consider pete for this job and and mr ferguson said well you know sure we'll talk to pete pete came down and we walked the property and pete just shook his head and said it's too severe we can't build a golf course there and uh, he always jokes in his interviews he said you know years later and, and i almost proved myself right because it was a difficult build it took three years to the day uh, to get it open and, um, you know, the second time he came back, he basically said, I'm going to build it whether you want me to or not. So that's how he got hired. <laughs> you know, if a guy tells you that, you got to hire him. <laughs> and, you know, he was he was special. He he took great pride in this project. He was here over 150 times. He walked the course forward. He walked it backward. He looked at it from all angles and really made a, made a unique and special golf experience. Yes, he did. You know, Dave, as you mentioned a moment ago about the the Donald Ross course, which dates back to 1917. It's the it's the site of the 1924 PGA Championship that was won by Walter Hagen, the first of his four consecutive PGA Championships, which back then was a, was a match play event. But talk a little bit about you know that golf course and the renovation that you guys went through with it back in 2006. Yeah, we um, you know the overtime the commitment to golf was just not. Uh, not tremendous here at the resort and thankfully the cook group when they bought the property back in 2005 realized that golf could be a great draw and um, they contracted with lee schmidt who's a partner with brian curley in schmidt curley design we brought in uh, the executive director of the donald ross society michael fay to consult on the project and and between all of us uh, it wound being wound up being a, a really great rehab of a donald ross classic uh, they opened up over 30 bunkers that had been closed in over time and expanded tees and uh, brought the greens back to their original shapes and sizes and uh, you know it's a challenge for anybody this year's uh this year's senior pga event was won by by colin montgomery and uh you know what a great ambassador he has been to the game of golf over the years obviously you know on the uh on the the uh, european tour event and or european tour and all, all the orders of merit that he won did you get a chance to talk to to colin after uh, this year's senior pga i actually had had a lot of interaction with him i actually flew to uh, atlanta on our our plane and and flew back with colin from the gwinnett championship to do the media day and got to spend quite a bit of time with him and he uh you know we we talked about a lot of things about his style of play about uh you know his days when he wasn't the most popular player out there on tour uh-huh. uh and you know he he's the first guy to admit that he gave the uh american press the the first inch uh in that deal that he always wasn't so well behaved and and so polite possibly, but I can tell you that there's no finer gentleman in the game than Colin Montgomery and, and no better spokesman, of course, for, for us and for senior golf right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I've, I, you know, I, I think he has done a great job with sort of, you know, reinventing himself. Not only we, we get to see him now, you know, doing some announcing on, on golf, ter- uh, on golf tournaments over the weekend. And, and I think that, you know, the change in personality that we get to see there, plus in, in ha- you know, him having won obviously so many times now recently on the, on the champions tour and flashing his great smile and that sort of thing. I think he's gone through a, a whole uh, renovation of his image. And uh, I think that's great for him. That's great for the game of golf and, and uh, great for you guys for having you know such a wonderful champion now getting uh, to represent you know your your course. So good for you know good for everybody all the way around. No, it really is. I uh, again, you know, some of the statements that he made at the end, like this being an iconic course that that people not only from America but from all around the world want to play, goes a long way because he's played all over the world and he's played those right. courses. And to rank us in that in that category was was very special for us. And I think. Uh, you know, we'll always be grateful. You know, and, and Dave, putting on a major tour event like you, you guys have done, you know, not only with the senior PGA, but, you know, you guys have hosted this Legends event for the ladies several times. Talk about, you know, the undertaking of putting something like that on, you know, aside from the course preparation, what's it like hosting something of that magnitude? Well, you know, this, the senior PGA, the, the PGA of America does a wonderful job. They brought in 
top-notch people to be here. Um, uh, the first person got here about 20 months in advance, and they kept kept uh, adding to staff and bringing in, uh, you know, qualified people to to do logistics, to do transportation, to do on course, to do hospitality, and you know, they're they're just really um, well versed at this. It's not something that that's new to them. It's new to us. And I think along the way we learned a lot about, um, you know, conducting championships and and what's good and what's not. You know, here in a rural area, parking and transportation were probably our two biggest challenges. Players had to shuttle to the course because of the lack of uh, parking once the hospitality was built. But, you know, we overcame that hurdle and it worked out well and, you know, didn't get too many complaints. Of course, you know, at the end of the day, the happiest guy is the winner and the, the rest of them are only <laughs> moderately happy. <laughs> and the first day, the course played really difficult. You know, it was uh, 48 degrees, and the wind was blowing about 30 miles an hour, so we only had wow. one, player, one player under par uh, the first day, and he was one under. So, But um, the Legends Championship, on the other hand, is our is our doing, you know, the, uh, the signage and the hospitality. And, you know, what we try to do with the Legends is make it a good spectator experience all the way around from our hospitality to our – kids activities this this event's unique in that we have families from the riley children's hospital here about 10 or 12 families to interact with the players we have a separate kids fest or kids area where local and area kids can come in first tee kids from the inner city and uh, interact with players i mean last year we had players in there coloring with the kids and and it it was just really a special family experience more or less yeah and you know the good news this year is uh, we've had such overwhelming support from our sponsors that we've decided that um, we're going to open up admission. We're not going to charge admission to this event because we're already covered. And uh, wow. this, this event is free admission to all. Wow, that's fantastic. You know, and, and Dave, when I when I start to think about, you know, the, the two golf courses, you know, the, the Dye course and the Donald Ross course, very different. Very different, you know, sort of in the, you know, the philosophy and the layout of the golf courses. And obviously the Ross course, you know, well dates the the die course. But even right down to the height of the grass on both golf courses. Talk about the contrast that people and players are going to see when they go from playing the die course and then going over to play on the Donald Ross course. Well, you know, as I tour people around and we look at the, the resort as a whole for a for a possible potential golf group or any other sort of group we always go to the donald ross first and and people love the building the old uh, clubhouse renovation kind of a period renovation back to the 30s 40s era and the views that you get off the veranda and the views that you get from the restaurant you know they're really swept away by it um, and then you take them to the pete die and it's like wow and you know we're we're pretty fortunate golf week magazine rated us as the number one and two public golf courses in indiana this year so, you know, I asked my boss what I could do to top that. And he said, well, you could have a tie. <laughs> 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 so, so I have, uh, I have a directive, I think. So anyway, the, uh, the Ross course fairways, of course, are, are, um, ryegrass fairways. The greens are bent in Poanya where, uh, the Pete Dye course is a hundred percent bent all the way. And it's hard. You won't find any Poanya in the greens and you won't find any in the fairways. So, uh, much higher, uh, much higher degree of um, detail at Pete Dye. Um, I think Donald Ross is just as hard in its own way. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the the contours tee to green. If you play just strictly the fairways, if you're in the fairway, the Pete Dye is not as severe tee to green as the Ross. You know, Ross, you've got some force carries, you've got some downhill uphill lies with long irons or woods to the to the green and. And it can be difficult in that way. Where if Pete die, you keep it in the fairway. It's very playable. <laughs> yeah, if you keep it in the fairway. From a, from a from a guy who stepped off a couple of those fairways, it's uh, that's easier said than done. But, and of uh, course, and of course, I, I failed to mention that the widest fairway is eighty five feet wide at Pete die. So you got to be pretty accurate to hit an eighty five foot <laughs> wide fairway, let alone forty feet. Yeah, no, and, that, and I think, to your point, I think that's the widest fairway. I think some of them are, are much more narrow than that. At least they, they felt more narrow when I was standing up there on the tee box looking out over them. So, yeah, it's, it is, you know, it's, it's 
certainly the most challenging golf course that I ever played. Also one of, one of the most beautiful ones. And, and, you know, one of the other things that you, you, that strikes you when you're out on the die course, not a lot of trees out there. So it's, it, it appears wide open yet. You know, we got some very, very narrow, uh, fairways. Yeah. It's very deceptive in that, you know, I think Pete uh, is a master at, you know, putting the target out there, but when you look straight at the target, that's really not the way you need to go. You know, every hole turns just a little bit. So, you know, hitting the fairway with that uh, illusion of of where the green sits in regard to the tee makes it tough. You sort of have to shape the shot or, you know, I I tell everybody just find the 150-yard marker and and that's where you need to hit it. Uh, Don't pay any attention to the alignment of the hole from the tee to the green. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, Dave, you know, um, I'm sure all the professional players that, you know, have played in, you know, whether it's the senior PGA or the legends events you get, I'm sure they're all, you know, just wonderful people, but is, is, is there a person or two that you look forward to catching up with when, uh, when you either, whether you get to play around the golf or they show up at the resort, getting ready for the, for the event, is there someone, you, you know, in particular that you look forward to sitting down with and uh, catching up with? You know, it's hard to pick out a single legend, uh, that I prefer. I, I, we, we become friends with so many, um, you know, Rosie Jones stands out, Laurie Rinker, who's won, uh, she placed second the first year and won this year or this past year. And, and then her brother played, of course, uh, in the senior PGA, we've kind of gotten close with her. Nancy Scranton, um, actually wears the French Lake colors, carries the French Lake bag on the legends tour. And she's a, you know, she's from Centralia, Illinois. So she's, she's been very close with us. Jane Blaylock has been a pleasure to work with. So I, I really can't, you know, single out anyone, you know, and of course, Colin Montgomery, I got more time with him than anyone else during the senior PGA. So I would, you know, I would have to say he was, he was definitely by far and away the one I dealt with and interacted with the most. Dave, for people coming to stay and play at the resort, what do you want everyone to walk away with, you know, regarding their time at the French Lick Resort? I think the, the, the single comment I would like to hear is it was worth it, you know, because we, we're we not yeah. necessarily the least expensive venue, but I think the quality reply that we um, provide uh, throughout the experience from time of check-in until you leave, uh, if they walk away and say it was worth it, then that really is uh, is what I'm after. Dave, remind our listeners, you know, one more time how they can get more information about the resort and then follow you guys over social media. The best way to learn about the resort is just to come. <laughs> but <laughs> but if you go. need con- but if you need convincing, uh just go to www.frenchlake.com. You know, we have a lot more here than just golf. Uh there's 3,000 acres of this property and there's always something going on from concerts to to spa weekends, to wine tastings, to many, many other activities. And, of course, we, we have a little casino sitting here on property also that's a lot that's of fun. That's right. Absolutely it is. Dave, it's, it's always so much fun to have you as part of the show. Privilege getting to catch up with you. I hope you'll come back after the Legends event and uh, share your stories and experiences from that because I'm excited to hear all about it. Well, and hopefully many of your listeners will uh, take advantage of our offer and come and, and see the greatest women ever to play the game. Yeah, and for free now. So, you know, boy, you can't beat that deal with a stick. So good for you guys and good for your sponsors for for coming through for what you needed. But, uh, yeah, it sounds like such an outstanding event with the greatest ladies that have ever played this game. So congratulations to all of you guys. I wish you guys, you know, all the best, obviously, with with that event. And like I say, I look forward to hopefully getting to hear all about it really soon. Indeed. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right. Take care, Dave. All the best to you and everyone out at the French Lick Resort. Give my best to everyone. Will do. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, Dave. That's Dave Harner, uh, head of uh, golf operations out at the French Lick Resort. And I'm telling you, folks, you know, had the privilege of being up there back in June. And what a spectacular resort. I mean, this, the resort itself is spectacular. I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of like you're stepping back in time a little bit because it's got, you know, this huge rocking chair porch that you get to sit out on on the front. And they've got a Dixieland band that plays there on the weekends. And they've got beautiful gardens in the back. And then and then on top of all of that, you get, you know, probably two of the greatest golfers, like Dave said, two of the, the two best in the state of Indiana and two of the best probably anywhere on the planet. And uh, it's it's just a spectacular experience all the way around. Again, go to FrenchLick.com uh, to uh, to get more information. You can follow them on Twitter at FrenchLickGolf and at FrenchLickResort. So great stuff. 
All right. Uh, we've got my next guest, Mr. Ben Wright, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Mr. Wright on the other side of this station identification. You're listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro. Heard around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. All right, now back with me on the Seymour Putters guest line is Mr. Ben Wright. I never would have guessed I'd have the honor of saying Ben Wright is making his fifth appearance with me on the show. He was a man I revered for so many years for the wonderful way he framed up golf for all of us on television, making the sport infinitely more enjoyable to watch. He is also one of the great storytellers of all time. He will forever live in the hearts and minds of golf fans for the wonderful work he did broadcasting the Masters for so many years with CBS, particularly in 1986 uh, during Jack Nicklaus's amazing victory. Please never forget that it was Ben Wright who used the phrase, yes, sir, to put an exclamation point on Jack Nicklaus's Eagle 3 on the 15th hole, two holes in 20 minutes before Vern Lundquist used it again in conjunction with Nicholas's birdie on 17. Don McLean's song, American Pie, with the lyrics, The Day the Music Died, is about the death of Buddy Holly. Well, for golf broadcasting, it didn't die, but it did suffer a pretty bad heart attack the day Ben Wright was no longer a part of it. I remain honored each and every time I get to say that Mr. Wright is next on the tee with me this morning. How are you, Mr. Wright? <laughs> totally bowled over by your magnificent uh, introduction of myself. You're way over the top, young Chris, but uh, thank you very much. It was extremely pleasant to listen to that. <laughs> well, I'm, like I say, I remain honored and uh, and humbled that uh, this is actually the fifth time you're joining me on the show. So it's uh, it's always a privilege, Mr. Wright. Thank and, you. And I want to... And I want to start today by getting your thoughts on the last two majors, the Open Championship and the PGA. How do you assess what we saw back at St. Andrews and then uh, more recently at Whistling Straits? Well, you know, I was uh, in my heart, I was hoping uh, for Spieth to win both of them and pull off this incredibly difficult uh, impregnable quadrilateral, as it was once known in the days of Bobby Jones, when, of course, they, they were the two amateur championships and the two Opens that counted. But um, that was my heart. But in my head, I had nothing but admiration for Zach Johnson, who's a little better. I mean, he hasn't got the length of these young uh, gunslingers of today. But that fella... It all guts. He just never gives up, and he grinds away. And uh, and of course, the part that he holds to get into the playoff was inspired. Uh, not many people make those downhill putts from the rear end of the 18th green. And uh, I, you know, it was a fantastic championship. Of course, the weather was pure Scotland, and uh, I remember. Vividly, Chris, I used to play at St. Andrews, the old course on a regular basis when I was stationed in the military um, not far away at Crail. And uh, we used to play matches. Our base would uh, play matches against St. Andrews University. And I lost count of the time when I played into the wind all the way out to the turn and then the tide changed, and I played into the wind all the way back. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, it, and then on occasions, it would blow from every corner of the compass with horizontal rain that really hurt your eyeballs uh, if you didn't shield them. <laughs> you know, that's Scottish golf, uh, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I thought it, I thought it was just a fantastic event. Obviously, it was a shame that Rory McIlroy had to miss it. Right. But I thought, you know, his performance at the PGA was really remarkable, coming off fifty-three days of rehab and no golf. And I, I thought that was really a, a terrific performance. But I found, uh, Chris, I, you know, I'm a I'm an avid viewer of television, even if I have to douse the sound most of the time. 
because <laughs> they never stop, they never stop talking. They, you know, they they're doing a radio show for the blind. Um, but I, I, I've never seen much more exciting a day than Saturday's third round at Whistling Straits. I thought it was absolutely unbelievable, and uh, and the, the, the fourth round was just as exciting. And I'm I'm really pleased for Jason Day, who's had a really tough young life. I mean, to be an alcoholic at the age of 12, who could only do that, I think, in Australia, uh, where drinking is a national pastime. Um, <laughs> first time I did, um, I was hosting the Australian Open for Mr. Kerry Packer, the late Mr. Kerry Packer, at the Australian Club. My producer, who is no longer with us, Mac Hemian, who was a fantastic guy, who uh, actually started ABC's Wide World of Sport. And we arrived at the Australian club at a quarter to eight for our first meeting with Mr. Packer and first production meeting. And at a quarter to eight, the uh, men's grill was filled with a hundred gentlemen drinking beer. At a quarter to eight a.m., I've never seen anything like it. No wonder uh, poor Jason was a, an alcoholic at the age of twelve. But he lost his father early, and then he went bad for a while. And of course, the fact that he is now a triumph on on golf's biggest stage was, uh, you know, a terrific performance and uh, and an exhibition of his character. You know, that he's put all that rubbish behind him and uh, is now, I think, entitled to be known as one of the new big three, don't you? With oh, Spieth absolutely. and uh, Makarov. Yes, I no, think no they, question. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, uh, he's got the power and he's got, there's absolutely no flaw in that young man's game. And when you think he collapsed with vertigo, uh, two months previously, it's even more remarkable, I think. I, I think we had two of the greatest championships, you know, of recent years, and all four were, were great, and and Master Spieth is mostly responsible because he is absolutely the greatest thing that, who has come along since Tiger Woods and since uh, Jack Nicklaus himself. As far as I'm concerned, it seems as that he is capable of pulling off that grand slam, as they call it, the four majors. I would love to see that accomplished before I pass on. Yeah, no, so would I. And I couldn't agree with you more about the excitement building around Jordan Spieth. And, and you know, Mr. Wright, when, when talking about Jack Nicholas, Gary Player has been on the show you know, several times with us. He always likes to point out how so many people talk about what a great winner Jack Nicholas was. But Gary likes to point out what a great loser Jack Nicholas was, always being so gracious in defeat. And I see a lot of those same qualities in Jordan Spieth with how he, you know, both stayed and watched and congratulated Zach Johnson at the, you know, at the conclusion of the Open Championship. Then the thumbs mm-hmm. up he gave Jason Day on the 17th hole at the PGA. He seems like such a classy kid in both victory and defeat. I'm just curious if, if you see the same sort of qualities, the same sort of Nicholas graciousness in, in Spieth. Yes, uh, you know, Gary Player, who, uh, you know, I've enjoyed a marvelous friendship since 1955, believe it or not, um, man and boy, as it were, uh, he's absolutely right about Jack Nicholas. That, that gentleman was even more gracious in defeat than he was in victory, and he was always the most gracious of winners, but he was a phenomenal loser. And, uh, uh, and you know, when you I mean, imagine how intense he was, um, I remember he actually blew the British Open of 1963 at Royal Lytham by bogeying two of the last four holes in the final round to miss the playoff, which was uh, uh, 
contested by Bob Charles and uh, your little Phil Rogers. Um, and I interviewed Jack afterwards, and we had a card table set up in uh, the pro Eddie Musty's shop, his office rather, above the shop. And uh, Jack, who had obviously uh, not calculated the adrenaline flow that caused him to go through both greens into awful uh, trouble. And one of them at the 15th when he went through the green, he finished in all the grass clippings that the, the, the guys had left there after, you know, mowing. And, uh, of course, obviously he had no chance. And he failed to get up and down in the same way at uh, the 17th from behind the green. And uh, I, I was saying to him, well, you're going to have to learn, Jack, you know, that the adrenaline flow becomes uh, more in, more intense and increased as the pressure mounts. And he said, absolutely right. You know, it's stupid of me. And I said, well, you know, you're still on, on the path to be the greatest golfer in the world. Is that your ambition? And he slammed his fist down on the card table said, certainly it is. I want only only one wish, and that is to be remembered as the greatest golfer of all time. And he slammed the table so hard with his fist that it collapsed in the <laughs> middle of our interview. And I had to scramble to get my microphone and set it up again because this was a, a radio broadcast I was, I was recording. Uh, and I shall never forget that because the intensity of the man was so incredible, but yet he could find that wonderful spirit of generosity when he uh, lost a major championship. And, of course, uh, he lost more almost than he won. I, I mean, right. I can think, I mean, I, you know, I, I think he was in the top four, what, 64 times uh, without winning. You know, and and then that's an incredible record, really. Uh, and I, you know, the, when I get on to the subject of Nicholas, I just run off at the mouth because I have never had more respect for a competitor in my entire life. Ah, that's great stuff. And, you know, Mister Wright, when we when we look at what what's going on in the game right now, and you know, we reflect back a little on Jason Day's victory here recently, three hundred eighty five yard drive. You know, we, we we saw Bubba Watson, you know, overdrive a green that was four hundred and four yards. You know, and and, mm-hmm. and Mister Nicholas has talked so so much, at, you know, recently and even you know over the years, I should say, and so is so is Mister Player about the golf ball. Have we gone too far? I mean, guys driving it, you know, three eighty-five, four hundred yards. Do we really? Is it time to to dial this thing back? Well, it's so long overdue. It's ridiculous. You know, I used to write a weekly golf column for the Financial Times newspaper of London, and I even gave that up in nineteen eighty-nine because of the pressures of television which, uh, you know, we were doing more and more golf at that time, and I had to quit. And um, I had been absolutely beating the uh, the governing bodies of the game over the head in my column for years, demanding the scaling back of the ball and the club. <laughs> and nothing happened, and nothing has. And it's, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, I I can't blame any of anybody for it except the uh, governing bodies of the world for allowing this to happen and make a mockery of magnificent golf courses. 
Yeah, and you know, at, at some point, you know, I mean, I, the USGA, you would think, you know, has got all of these sort of regulations. I mean, we we got you know a million rules in the game of golf, and they got regulations for you know the design of golf balls and and the clubs and that sort of thing. And I just mm-hmm. wonder if they have they you know left that behind. Is anyone taking a look at this thing? Because to your point, I mean, we've heard for years about you know some of the great golf courses of the world becoming more obsolete, and even so, at you know at the Open Championship, if you know if the if the weather doesn't play a factor at, at St. Andrews, they, these guys can make mm. a mockery. That golf course is sort of defenseless, but at some point we've got to get back to, you know, making the golf ball more in line so that uh, it, it, these things just don't become a pitch and putt. Well, absolutely right. I mean, you can't go on making courses longer forever because, uh, you know, br- the price of real estate is, is, uh, astronomical as it is and you certainly don't need golf courses going to the wall because they're not long enough uh, which is one of the saddest things but it is it's happening already right. and uh, and uh, it's a disgrace uh, an absolute disgrace that the RNA and the USGA have not done anything until now and they don't look like they're, they're planning to do anything which is right. absurd it's right. absolutely absurd and you know it's uh, it's such a shame because that whistling Straits is, is a lovely golf course um, it has far too many bunkers I mean a thousand bunkers is absolutely absurd since very few of them come into play uh, at all in fact, you could probably do away with 900 bunkers and still have <laughs> quite enough. And you know something? And the maintenance bills. I mean, it, it, it's because Mr. Kohler, who owns the place, is so darn rich. He's made so many million toilets um, <laughs> that, you know, then he can afford the maintenance bill. But it's absolutely absurd to have so many bunkers. We are, I, I love Pete Dye's designs, don't get me wrong, and I have nothing but admiration for Mr. Dye, who's a genius, but he's a wayward genius. And, uh, you know, a, another thing, uh, Chris, uh, if I may say so in criticism of Mr. Dye, I've only done a handful of courses, and I'm an amateur architect, but I would never make the ninth and 18th holes play into the setting sun. That's absurd. And uh, I think, you know, I want to wrap Mr. Pete Dye over the knuckles for that. But it's still a wonderful golf course. (laughs) And it's so inventive and so spectacular along the shores of that wonderful lake. Uh, It's hard to pick holes in it, but I think, you know, you've got to be realistic. Not, not many people can afford these astronomical maintenance bills that uh, Mr. Cole has, must have to pay to keep a thousand bunkers in order. It, mm-hmm. And that's, an, you know, another thing. The game is getting too darn expensive. Right. Mr. Wright, you you gave me one of my favorite lines of all time on this show the last time you joined me. We were talking about Tiger Woods, and I know he's playing well this weekend at the Wyndham Championship, you know, albeit against the likes of guys named Tom Hogue, Scott Brown, and Jim Herman. But the last time you were with me, you told me you knew what Tiger Woods was suffering from, and that was the agonies of the damned which is an outstanding line. Talk about you know what, what you're seeing from Tiger and uh, what you meant by that line. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm rooting for him uh, this weekend. I mean, I, I watched Spellbound yesterday because he played, you know, after a terrible start, three-putting the first green. He played absolutely magnificently. And, uh, you know, he's... Uh, there's life in the old dog yet. 
It, you know, and you look back and we've talked a little bit about, you know, Jack Nicholas and he had such, he had a down year in 1979, perhaps the worst, you know, of his golfing career, only winning just a little over $59,000 that, that year before coming back the following year in 1980, winning two majors at the age of 40. Tiger is about to turn 40, right? In December, do you, do you see him being able to pull off something similar to Jack Nicholas's thing and, 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 and recapture the glory, or is this too much of a young man's game? You talk about the new big three with Spieth, McElroy, and Day. Is it is it too much of a young man's game now for him to ever get back to that level? I think that's the problem. The uh, opposition uh, don't fear him as they did a few years ago. I mean, when you get a man as talented as Ernie Els, say that he feels uh, he was playing for second every time uh, Tiger teed it up in a major championship. When you get a man uh, of his caliber, else's caliber, saying that, you know that Tiger's got the Indian sign on the field, but they don't care about that anymore. They don't care about his reputation and what he's done in the past. This new young generation are superbly conditioned athletes, who have no fear of, uh, you know, Tiger or anyone else for that matter. You look at, you know, Jordan Spieth's season so far, Mr. Wright, and, you know, in the major, and we talked about it a little earlier, but you talk about a guy who finished first, first, fourth, and second. You know, he's, he's just the fourth player ever to finish in the top five in all four majors in a season. The only the third player to finish in the top four in all four. The only other two were Nicholas and, and Woods. Where where in your mind does Jordan Spieth's season rank in the uh, history of golf? Well, I think he, he ranks very highly. And goodness me, he's just a child. Or, you know, he's just turned 22. And there's no telling what he may achieve. And uh, I think the... The rivalry between himself and Rory and Jason Day is going to be absolutely brilliant, maybe for decades. Who knows? I mean, and there's a bunch of other brilliant young players hanging around who are, are, you know, are banging at the door. I'm thinking about someone like Brandon Grace, who really lost two majors or his chance to win two majors with just two bad holes, the 17th at Chambers Bay and the 10th at Whistling Straits. And he was he was really right in the thick of things until two bad holes. And, you know, that, that guy is going to be around for a long time. There's so many of them. Another one that takes my eye was playing with Tiger these last two days, and, and that's Brooks Kepka who finished really well yesterday. And, uh, you know, this kid's not far away from it. There's, there's literally dozens of them, Chris, that, right. are, that are brilliant young players. And, uh, you know, Billy Horschel. I mean, they, they just, you can reel off 20 or 30 who are all banging at the door uh, to win a major. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tony Finau's another guy, 25-year-old rookie on tour this season. There's a, a guy who's caught my eye, finished tied for 14th at the U.S. Open and tied for 10th at the Open Championship. So to your point, there are a lot of 20-somethings that look like, you know, the game of golf is uh, is in really good hands uh, for, for many years to come. So I couldn't agree with yes. you more there. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's a, a, another thing, Chris, you know, that uh, young Indian, Lahiri, who finished tied for fifth with Pepco uh, at the PGA, you know, is showing the way for global golf. Uh, and, of course, we all know about the Asians. Uh, they're already uh, knocking at the door. Uh, but um, it's, it's truly a fantastic global game, which is another reason why I don't think poor Tiger Uh, can ever really establish any domination in his 40s. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Ripey, before we let you go, what events do you have coming up that uh, our folks, uh, our listeners might be able to, you know, either see you at or hear you at? What what else is on your calendar for the rest of this year? Well, next week, my wife and I go to Crystal Mountain, uh, Michigan, for the Ben Wright Invitational at hey. Crystal Mountain. And uh, well, that is a quite successful uh, tournament for junior golf. And um, we've got a waiting list every year, and we've probably got to make a decision next week as to whether we go to two golf courses instead of uh, playing uh, alternate days on alternate courses. You know, uh, I think we've probably... Because if you've got a, a long waiting list and you keep turning people away, Eventually, they're going to become discouraged and won't bother. Right. And I think I think we're probably going to have to go to two golf courses for next year, and that'll that'll be great for everybody. I mean, you know, it'll give more people the opportunity to play, and it's a very pleasant event. And uh, you know, and more, and more money, of course. Sure. Mr. Wright, it is always such an honor and a privilege for me to have you as part of the show. Thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to join me. I hope I get the opportunity to catch up with you following that event and uh, later on in this golf season to hear you know, more of your insights and uh, then more stories from your amazing career because you're so fantastic. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Chris. It's a, it's a pleasure. Let's make it 55 appearances before I pass on. <laughs> I hope we do. I would love that. <laughs> well, I've only got uh, about two weeks now before I turn 83. So uh, I'm hoping that I make it. <laughs> yeah. So am I, and I'm sure you will. So, uh, you know, and I look forward to every one of those next 50 appearances with you on the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being willing to join me. And thank you for making this show so much fun to be a part of when you're on it. It's, uh, it's always an honor, sir. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Ed. All the best to you and your family. I look forward to catching up with you again real soon. Thank you. Take care. That's legendary broadcaster Ben Wright. And boy, I tell you what, there, I, I'm sure there isn't a better storyteller on the planet than Ben Wright. And uh, he is certainly somebody that uh, I miss. I miss him on, uh, on the, you know, whether it's CBS or whoever is broadcasting golf. I really miss hearing his voice and him being a part of it. He was a staple for so many years and brought so many golf tournaments to life through his, uh, his amazing broadcasting talent. So uh, our thanks to him for being a part of the show today, and we certainly look forward to catching up with him again real soon. All right, uh, we've got our next guest, Sean McKeel, ready to join us. We're going to get to Sean on the other side of this station identification. You're listening to Next on the Tee with Chris Mascaro, heard around the world on the Armed Forces Radio Network. All right, now back with me and ready to answer more of your questions on the Seymour Putters guest line is our friend and 2003 PGA champion, Sean McKeel. Hey, Sean, how are you, my friend? Hey, Chris, good morning. Sean, I I wanted to start off today by uh, talking a little bit about your experiences at Whistling Straits. You were there playing in the PGA Championship again this year. What was was that event like for you? Well, certainly, uh, you know, it's it's uh, an event that, that, Brings back a lot of a lot of great memories for me. Um, obviously, being a major championship, the you know you're presented with the best field in golf and uh, at a great golf course. And the PGA of America does, you know, they do so many great things. Um, you know, the Champions Dinner on Tuesday night is always always fun, and uh, I get a chance to to meet new people and and uh, listen to some stories and <clears throat> get a free meal to boot. So um, there's a lot of great things, you know. Uh, it was a good week, and um, it's, it's something I always look forward to. I, I just I did see something yesterday that might have been the day before that they were thinking about going back to Oak Hill in 2023, which would be 20 years removed from our win. So right. I thought a little bit about that, and and uh, how many more of these things, you know? Well, I'm going to keep playing for a few more years, but how many more? Um, you know, am I going to play in? And I think what, you know, being a champion of these events, of course, you know, the Masters, the, the Open Championship, and the and the PGA all grant 
uh, their former champions uh, exemptions, I think probably till 60, maybe 65. I don't really know exactly the, the date. I hadn't looked at it yet. And, uh, you know, so it, it, when you, when you look out in your career, it's, it's actually one of those events, you know, most people don't have the pleasure of determining the, the last day that they'll go to work. And, um, maybe some of, some people do, but, um, you know, I look out and I've been thinking about that. You know, what year do you think I'm going to quit playing? Because I, I can tell you that I probably will stop playing golf um, on, you know, the last day, whether I make the cut or not, um, at a PGA championship. I just don't know when that's going to be. Um, you know, I say the PGA because the senior PGA is in the early summertime. So um, the PGA championship, whatever day, it'll, be, it'll either be a Friday or a Sunday, but whatever year that's going to be will be my last tournament. So, I do kind of have that, you know, on the horizon uh, somewhere down the road. But, you know, they uh, presented a great product last week, as they always do. Um, You know, a lot made of the golf courses, uh, whether it's the USGA and their course setup and their philosophy on that. But uh, the PGA of America really, uh, they do a good job, I think, with – you know, allowing us to play, allowing us to score, but also presenting – a course that's it's challenging, and uh, if you're not playing your best golf, um, you know you'll you'll find that out pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And you know, for for those folks that that don't remember, uh, Whistling Straits is where you defended your PGA uh, Championship title mm-hmm. back in 2004. So you know, and I saw the pictures that you know that you and your caddy, the you know top club fitter Scott Felix, posted. Yeah, and uh, look look fantastic, and, and and you know what a wonderful event to your point. But for you, what was it like, kind of going back through and sort of retracing your steps from 2004 and being back at Whistling Straits? Well, certainly one thing, um, and I, I alluded to this uh, to several people. I, I on the on the putting green, there's two putting greens there. There's there's one um, that's on you know just kind of right next to the range, and there's another one 20 yards away, uh, more towards the first tee box. Um, and there's actually a little notch cut out in the putting green, which is now which is now a part of the putting green, but it was a tee box. Now, when I played my media day, I remember, I'll never forget, it was, uh, it was in May. It was after the memorial. Bobby Clampett and I flew up in his plane uh, to do my media day. And, uh, of course, not ever seeing the golf course. I came out there and, um, you know, I was paired with, uh, I think I was paired with Sean McManus from CBS and uh, M.G. Orander, who was the president of the Beach of America, and maybe the pro from, uh, from Whistling Straits. Well, anyway, the first hole... The tee box was literally on the edge of this putting green. Now, the wind was coming in. It's, you, the, you, your tee shot on one, at least from this tee box, is a little bit It's east-southeast. And the wind was dead in off the lake. And I hit a driver, and I think I hit like a three or two iron into the first green. And uh, that's where it all got started. And I couldn't believe just the, uh, well, the length of the course, the difficulty of the course with, you know, with where they had decided to put the rough and the fescue and everything else. Um, but then when I came back two and a half months later, it was a totally new golf course. The tee box was no longer on the, on the putting green on one. It had been moved up about 80 yards, 80, 90 yards. Wow. Um, you know, so, and the rough had been cut back and, you know, much like this year, I think that, um, you know, I, I shot 77 in the first round in 2004 and came back, and I think I shot the lowest three scores of anybody in the field the last three days. And um, But I think what happened again, and it even happened to me, I think, a little bit this year, is that you get this mindset that how difficult the golf course can play, and you have that kind of, I guess that's kind of a negative mindset. And you go out there and you think, oh, I'm just going to hit some fairways and hit on the greens, avoid the trouble. And by the time you play around a few holes, you realize that nobody else is thinking the same way. They're thinking about making birdies. Um, And so your philosophy has to change a little bit. And sometimes it's too late by the time you recognize that. And I think that's what happened to me definitely in 04. Because I remember thinking I played too conservatively. and, And by doing that, I put myself in a lot more trouble. And then I tried to press and I shoot 77. And finally came back and played three pretty good rounds. But, um, you know... The course didn't change that much. It was an outstanding shape, uh, as it always is. The greens were, were probably the best greens 
you know, I've ever putted on. Um, you know, they talk about Houston's greens with a heavy overseed rye. Um, but these bent greens were, if you got them online, and, it, and the scores showed that. Um, you know, there's some undulations in the greens. They weren't overly quick. They did a great job of uh, allowing guys uh, to, to make putts um, and not be so defensive. Um, they had some tough pin placements, but they gave the ball uh, plenty of room to stop. And by that, I mean if they put a if they put a pin in near a swale, they didn't put it right up against the swale. For if you're short or long, you didn't have to worry about putting it 10 or 15 feet by. You know, you actually had a chance. Mm-hmm. So they did a good job with the course setup. And I think that is um, that in the way the conditions played. Um, it was very difficult for me on Thursday afternoon. The wind was blowing 20, 25 miles an hour. Um, and that was really the only time that it blew, and it was really it was frustrating um, because I, I was playing well, and and uh, just we had a tough time even holding some of the greens, particularly the sixth green. All three of us in our group, Rich Bean, Y Yang, and myself, had 100 yards to the flag and couldn't hold the green. Wow! Uh, and of course, the rough is you know six inches deep back behind the green there. Um, you know, it's just kind of potluck, but it was frustrating. I think, um, but the conditions. I think the conditions of the course, the the weather that had moved in, um, some of the, just the softness of them, just allow for great scoring. Um, people look at the scoring and they think, oh, it wasn't it wasn't right for a major championship. But um, in the end, they got the two they got two guys that they wanted to see. Everybody wants Jordan Speed to be up there, and then, of course, I guess it's a toss up between you know Jason Rory you know, Dustin Johnson for some redemption and, and, and others, you know, so they got the two two guys, two of the five or six guys that people are always writing about and talking about up there at the top. So regardless of score, they end up getting a great, a great champion. So, right. uh, you know, it was, it was fun to watch. It was disappointing to have missed a cut by one. Um, it seems to yeah, be the that's... my year, but. Yeah, that's that's sort of the question, Sean. I mean, you know, you mentioned the sixth hole, but you know, missing the, missing the cut by a stroke. Do you look back? At any one stroke or any one hole, and, and and you know, say if only when you miss a, a cut by you know that narrow of a margin. Well, I I, th- I think you always do, but I think that's that's even more important for these young people that are listening and playing today to to realize that you don't tee off on the first hole and make a mental error, whether you just go up and you backhand a one footer or you just zone out, and make a stupid mistake on the first hole because you're like, oh, I still got a bunch of holes to make up for it. Well, you know what? Every shot costs you. Um, so sure, there are things that have happened. Uh, you know, I look back. I played a great first nine holes. Was one under. Uh, matter of fact, on 18, which was just brutal. Uh, I had to hit a three wood into the green. If that tells you how how long the hole wow. was playing. You know, 18. Rich Beam had 280 pin. I had 259 pin, and Y Yang had like 250 pin. Um, you know, so uh, we all hung in there, and we just got around to number two, and I'd I'd laid up in the rough. And the wind was really hard off the right. And I tried to, you know, if you go left at number three or two green, it's, you know, really a lot of trouble. And I just tried to hold off the sand wedge, and I hit it a little bit to the right. Now, I was I was only five or six yards right of the green in the short stuff, and I could putt. But there were two sprinkler heads literally on top of this right in my line. I couldn't go around them because if I go left of them, the ball rolls to the front of the green. If I go right, it goes to the back. So I was forced to chip, and I had to pitch over the mounds, and it was straight downhill, and I could only get it you know, the 12, 14 feet. And so, but, you know, had I not missed the green with a, with a 52 degree, I wouldn't have had to chip over those. So, you know, there's just things that you, things that you find out there that, that, um, you know, you don't really think too much about I'm a bogey in a par five. It's definitely something uh, you, know, you, you don't want to be doing, uh, especially in the wind, you know, because there's so many difficult holes coming into the front nine that, that really there's no birdie holes. So, um, it, it may be five, um, and you would say six, except where the pin was located with the wind direction. But yeah, there's always things out there that you do. You try not to make silly mistakes because a poor tee shot, a poor iron shot, you know, those types of things happen. Um, you know, but you know, little mental, mental errors, uh, such as probably what I made on two, that's one shot. Um, you know, I made a mistake on number nine the second day. I hit it to the right, I missed hit a seven iron, and it got up in the wind and went in the water, and I made double. And now I've got nine holes. I went from one under to one over. So now I'm three over for the tournament, uh, trying to figure out how am I going to get back to two or one. Um, So, yeah, you just can't afford to let those types of things happen. And I think as you age, 
you just get so exhausted because your mind is just constantly working. It's just always working in major championships. It's hard to, you know, they talk about when guys go from Augusta to Hilton Head, just how it's a, it's an easier week. And it is an easier week because you don't feel like, you know, one poor swing can cost you either the tournament or making the cut. And that's, that's the thing that you find at major championships. And, um, which is why usually the cream rises to the top at the end. It's just guys that are, have experience and, um, you know, um, that aren't making the mistakes and they're have been there before and, and all those things. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's always frustrating when you go back and look at, at some of the things, wow, if I only hadn't done this, but you know, that's why you gotta, yeah. it's why you gotta pay attention before, <laughs> before you play your shot. I mean, really? So, yeah. And it, when I look over that, that golf course and what we, what we watched over the weekend, Sean 17, it was as a par three that you birdied in the first round, you bogeyed it in the second round. It was essentially the hole where Jason day put the tournament away on Sunday and Jordan mm-hmm. Spieth giving him that classy thumbs up on day's lag. But talk about how tricky that hole played. Well, you know, that hole didn't play as difficult this year. Um, you know, I, uh, I did bogey it on Friday. I had a, had a, probably half club too much and I was just 10 high right and I had to chip over this hill and just, I, I couldn't get it to within 10 feet but the hole pretty much played with the wind off the right and um it, you know as anybody that watched could see there's a there's some funneling that allows people to access the back left of the whole of the whole location there which was there a couple of days it was farther back on Sunday than it was on Friday but, you know, the left side, and I'm, and I'm sure there were people that hit it down there. I think Dustin Johnson hit it down there, and, and I think Nicholas and May hit it, hit it down there, but, um, and probably a few other guys. But it's just a place that you have to avoid. Um, you know, it's 200, I want to say, from the tee box in the back. It's like 201 to the front, and there's a sprinkler back in the back. It's 201 front. Now, there is a tee that is farther back into the right, which they didn't use. Um, but there's a bunker on the front right of the green that's literally eight feet tall from from the front of the green. Right. So there was a pin placement there that I think Jordan made a heck of a shot um to get it close to the to that whole location on the right. But um you know with the wind blowing off the right, guys have no fear of, of just starting it over to the right and holding it off and just hitting the middle of the green or getting it to turn over a little bit. Um uh, I know you were talking about golf balls and stuff like that with Ben earlier. Um right. you know it's, it really is true that the but the balls, they they don't curve as much. I mean, um, so guys just feel a lot more comfortable, I think, with their equipment and their swings and everything else. But that hole is, is, is difficult. But, again, it's 201 front. All you really got to do is carry it to the front of the green. It's not like you had to fly it back 225. Um, you know, that would you know make for a difficult shot because you're playing a longer club. But, um, you know, it's – it's a hole that, uh, as you saw, uh, didn't really present a whole lot of problem, I think, just because of the conditions of the, of the golf course and just the softness of it. Um, when it firms up like it was in 04 and it was in 2010, it's a hole that's a lot more difficult because now you can't just fly it onto the green because uh, you're, you're, you're wary of, of going over, um, and there's, there's problems over the green as well. So. Um, it just didn't allow, I think the golf course was just, it was just there for the taking. And you saw that with the scoring. And Sean, you, uh, you and Scott Felix are good friends. It's thanks to you that we were able to have Scott on the show earlier this summer. Talk about, you know, having uh, him on the bag this week and getting to experience, uh, you know, this event, uh, with Scott. Well, you know, we, uh, we've really gotten to be good friends the last few years. Uh, you know, we've known each other a long time. Um, but um, he got it for me last year, and, and we had a great time, and he wanted to do it again this year. And he'd heard so much about whistling straights. Uh, it was just – but, you know, it, it was nice just to take a friend up there and uh, someone that really knows the game, knows my game, <clears throat> knows my tendencies, um, and uh, just have a relaxing week. Uh, you know, we went to dinner together, and, and it was just great for a week to be able to do that. Uh, he was awed, really, by the course, and – um, just the condition of the course. Um, you know, it's one thing to, to go to a major championship and be outside the ropes and to be able to watch, but it's wholly another to be inside the ropes participating, um, you know, being inside the, the, the just the, the conditions of, the, of a major championship, uh, listening to other players and their caddies talk, you know, club selections, 
I mean, just all those types of things to be actually part of the action is is, uh, is a unique experience for anyone. And yeah, I know he had a great time with that, and and uh, I had a good time having him on the bag. It's just uh, I felt bad. I felt really bad, you know, for missing the cut. And he asked me something, you know, asked me about you know, um, you know, <laughs> missing the cut, you know. And I said, well, missing the cut by one is the same as missing the cut by eight or nine. So. Um, you know, I think he he got that pretty quickly. How disappointed that I was to have fought yeah. that hard um, to just come up short. You know, there are other guys out there that um, you know they're going to tee off on on Thursday and, and are just happy to be in the field and uh, have really have no chance to ever make the cut because if they don't play, and there are some club professionals, you know, that that had some pretty high scores. But I mean, it was a testament to doing what they do to be able to even qualify for that tournament. So these guys are good players. It just it's just so difficult. But um the fact that I worked so hard um to come up one short um you know and get basically the same thing as a guy that finishes twenty over par. Uh, it's it's always a tough pill to swallow and that's that's what's difficult about the profession. But you know, we shared some he he shared some uh some good moments you know, that some of the other guys in my group had talked about my game and were surprised at really how well I was playing considering I haven't played a whole lot, um, which made me feel good. But it just doesn't take away the sting of, of coming up one short. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, look, I wasn't going to win the golf tournament, I don't think, at, at, at making the cut at two over par with the way those guys were playing. That's not really the point. The point is getting in contention and playing for four days. Um, and, again, people forget that this is how – you know, we make our living. And then so when you make the cut, you get paid. And when you don't, you don't get right. paid. Um, and uh, regardless of where anybody is in their career, you want to get paid for the work that you do. Because I, I hit some pretty darn good shots and entertained some folks for, for a couple of days, uh, signed a lot of autographs, did a lot of things. Um, so it's uh, it's part of it, I guess. And I, I'm I'm kind of used to it, but it still stings to – come up one short and to work as hard as I did. So I guess I just need to work yeah. harder. I mean, that's, um, I quit making the mistakes. I mean, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. It, it all falls on me. So, uh, but, uh, it was, it was, yeah. it was fun. It was a fun week. So that sort of leads us right into our first question this week, uh, from one of our listeners. And the question is, what did you take away about your game from whistling straights on the positive side? And where will we be able to see you playing again soon? Well, I tell you, I drove the ball outstanding. I really did. It's probably the best I've driven the ball in, in a very, very long time. And it's just something I keyed in on a couple of weeks ago when I was practicing with my father. Um, but I think just knowing that my game is there, I mean, ultimately, a guy that wins, you know, he makes the most birdies. He makes the most par putts. And those types of things, I had my opportunities on Friday. Um, I putted the ball extremely well. And putting well and making them, are are sometimes similar in that, you know, I, I hit my lines, I, I hit the edges of the hole, and that's, you know, uh, you got to get them to go in. But I felt so good about everything that I was doing. Um, I was relaxed. So there's a lot of great things that I take away from my game. My My thing is now going forward is what events do I play in? And uh, I just don't know. I, uh, I didn't obviously get into the, the tournament this week in Greensboro. I'm not in the playoffs. I'm not in the FedEx. I'm not in the web.com finals because I didn't play any web.com events this year. Not one, uh, not by choice. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've written for several exemptions. I actually, I actually wrote for an exemption for a Canadian tour event, which is now the McKinsey tour. And I was turned down. Uh, tournament director just decided that they had a lot of worldwide interest from other players and that thank you for your interest, but we can't give you the exemption. So I'm, wow. I'm doing some of the things. Uh, and I think that goes back to just realizing um, just how far, you know, how far people fall, how quickly people forget about you. They forget about all the great things that you have done and brought to the game, not only on the golf course, but just in interaction, I think sponsor interaction those types of things. And I think these tournament directors, they don't, they don't get it. They just don't get it. And it, 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 it's not just me. I think there's other players too. So people would say, well, Sean, you must not be trying to play tournaments. Well, yeah, of course I'm trying to play tournaments. I'm, I'm riding a, a, a tour that's three steps below the PGA tour and I'm not able to, 
to get a start. And, and uh, you know, of course, you know, it, it's kind of a woe is me story, I suppose. But it's uh, it's frustrating because I want to play. I feel like I am playing well. Um, but there's no place for me to go play. Um, you know, I, well, I say that. And, I mean, I'm not going to go down and I'm not going to go play a tournament um, for a first prize is two thousand dollars, and I've got to spend fifteen hundred dollars to get there, and I got to win to to make my money back. I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, I get just as much out of my game playing with my friends and my dad and by myself here. I'm just, I'm not going to do that. And so, um, you know, I've really, like I said, I think I only wrote for one or two exemptions for the web.com. I think maybe just one, and only maybe one or two for the PGA Tour. Um, so. Uh, I just I can't wait to get to age 48 when um, you know I can play uh, some of these events on the Web.com tour and uh, don't have to ask for exemptions because I, I tell you I, frankly I'm just completely sick of it and uh, I think that the the PGA tour needs to do a better job of figuring out you know places for you know veteran members. There's a lot of us out there, um, right? You know to play. I mean you look at Look at Tiger's event. I use that as an example because it's fresh in my mind. I think I finished the week 32nd alternate, so I was 152 out of 120 man field. Um, but for the web.com event the week, I was, a, I think, 98th alternate. So the fact that I, I'm 30 all, 32nd alternate for, for Tiger's event, but I'm 198th alternate for a web.com event, um, you know, <laughs> shows you something. All right. Um, you know, about the way it's all set up. I mean, it's designed right. for these young players and it's designed to get us old guys out. And, um, I understand that if guys aren't playing, they're not making cuts, they're not going to the Q school, they're not doing the things necessary to, uh, to keep their game up and just, Hey, you know what? I just give me a spot. Cause I did this and this and this. I think there is part of that, but, um, for those of us, those of us that are out there, you know, submitting our entries to go to the web.com tour school and those types of things. I think they need to they need to take a look at some of the eligibility um, for guys that have earned the right to play. Uh, and I, I think guys that earn the right to play the web.com tour. You know, Bill Calfee will tell you that it's it's not a developmental tour. Uh, he's the person that runs the web.com. You know, many have argued that the, that the web.com is a developmental tour. And he would argue that it's not. And uh, since it's not a developmental tour, there should be an act. There should be a place for guys uh, that have that have you know I think respected and played and and uh, done a lot of great things on the PJ tour. Uh, right. What you know, and, and you know, we've had Don Barnes who owns and runs the Sun Belt yeah. Senior Tour on here, and you you were the one that actually suggested Don to me because that that tour is yeah. set up for guys trying to stay sharp and preparing yeah. for the Champions Tour. Might we see you out there? Well, you know, Don actually sent an email. I think he was pretty frustrated with me actually in the tone of his email that uh, you know he was hoping that I might be able to play in the Niagara tournament, uh, which is I think the end of this month. But I had told my wife and I. You know, if I had qualified for either played well in the Reno and, and the PGA or had, uh, you know, gotten in the playoffs somehow, uh, I would be doing that. But I, was, I thought we were going to take a, take a little trip at the end of the month. And, uh, you know, Don was hoping I was going to play the one in New York, and but that was really kind of never on my radar because of the things with my family. And, uh, and, and I think it's difficult when you go um, – particularly living in where I live, a lot of the events are on the East coast and, um, they're playing for purses that are $2,500 for first. And, um, you know, there's a few bigger prizes and stuff like that. But again, it's hard for me to just, you know, either flying or driving over there, paying an entry fee of $700, um, you know, and, uh, you know, basically having to win to get my money back because again, this is how I make my living. You know, um, I've done a lot right. of things in my life. And will continue to do a lot of things in my life that benefit, you know, men, women, children. Particularly with my Make a Wish tournament, I'll help out anybody. If you knew me at all, I will give. I give anybody money. I, I don't, you know, I, people on the street. I just if they need money, I give it to them. You know, and um, you know, I've done a lot of things in my career that have not directly benefited me. I mean, I think in the end, they all make you feel great. So that is a huge, huge intangible. But right. I think I'm kind of done with the things of, of, you know, realizing that it's kind of like, you know, I'll, I'll use this example. You know, my wife's an attorney. And although she doesn't practice, 
she hasn't practiced in a while, she keeps her license up. And I don't cannot tell you how many people have called my wife, either tour players or um, or other people that have sought advice from her, have talked to her in the corner at a at a tournament. Um, you know, trying to get advice from her. And I finally told her, I said, why are you doing this for free? Quit doing this for free. You went and you have, you you paid for law school. You spent all that money, all that time, get your license to pay for your insurance, to, to do all these things. And now you're just giving free advice out. This is how you make your living. This is how you, you know. And so I think to that end, I mean, I've kind of started seeing some of those things. It's like I'm not, you know, so it's hard for me to go and, and, and participate in something um, you know, a, a tournament that if I'm not going to make money, I'm not going to just sign up to go lose money is basically what it, what it comes down to. Right. Um, you know, so, um, it's just, I, uh, you know, I want to keep playing and I, and I will keep playing and I'll keep working hard. And I think that's really why I stopped writing for exemptions, you know, a couple of years ago because I started realizing, you know, okay, you know, I'm not playing that well kind of had some injuries and stuff like that. Let's just see if I can do it the old-fashioned way. Get back in. I'll get into a tournament, make a little bit of money or, or whatever, and now get into the reshuffle, which I did a, a couple years ago on the web.com tour and played a few events out there. So, you know, those are the types of things that I need to be to be focused on. Um, and, again, that's I think that's really why I just stopped writing. Um, you know, just it's a young man's game. Um, I don't think a lot of these tournaments – they're they're all about you know making money. The Web dot com tour, uh, many if not all of the events sell their pro am spots. So for example, there's a tournament that, that mentioned to me, hey, if you uh, you want to bring a team to the uh, tournament, you want to sell a team for us at eighty five hundred dollars, we'd be happy to give you a spot. That goes on every single week out there, and I don't huh. think people realize that, which no. is hard to really comprehend when. Um, you, you have the PJ Tour sponsorships that are forbidden from paying a guy to come to their events. Uh, they do it in other ways. Uh, Zurich has done it. Um, you know, they have a, how many Zurich guys do they have on the PJ Tour? And I guarantee you, every single one of those guys plays in New Orleans. So those types of things go on. And I don't really look at them uh, negatively just because of all the events that I've participated in Europe. I've certainly been a direct beneficiary to winning the PJ Championship. and have won, uh, you know, played the Johnny Walker and got a six-figure chunk of change to come play in the Johnny Walker, which I finished, I think, third or fourth, you know, in 2004 or five. And, and, and so I don't really look at those as bad things. I just look at some of the things that are going on, you know, under the table uh, that are that are frustrating, right. things I'm not going to participate in. Yeah. And, you know, because I, you know, I, I there's going to come a time, you know, in 2000, in, in two more years, when I turn 48, that I'm not going to need an exemption to play some of these events that have that I've written for and have been turned down for. And uh, you know, um we'll see how my, we'll see how my attitude is in a year and a half. Uh but uh you know, I think that uh you know, I don't expect to be asked to do much. Uh but if I am, I'm I'm certainly going to give it some thought as to to who who has been there, you know, calling me, texting me, how you doing, how you feeling and uh, yeah, we'd be happy having this field and those that aren't. You know, so, right. <laughs> you know, uh, turnabout is fair play, as they say. <laughs> and uh, you know, we'll see. We'll, you know, but uh, for for right now in the interim, back to the to the answer to right. the question, I don't know when I'm going to play again. I really don't. So let, let's turn the tables onto a, a more positive note, I guess. You know, unless unless of course you're me in this situation, because I'm not sure to take <laughs> this next this yeah. next question that, that that I got, Sean. But w- the question is, when are we going to get to hear the Sean McKeel show? No, you know, I um, the the Golf Channel and I have uh, we, we've talked on several occasions about maybe coming down and participating in some of their some of their shows. Uh, Rich Beam and I played together last week at the PGA and. He had done some stuff for the Golf Channel. I think now does a lot with Sky Sports in Europe. Um, and uh, we had we had kind of had a brief conversation uh, just about some of the on-air talent, you know, where where I might fit um, and those types of things. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm always eager to look at you know look at things down the road. I I enjoy um, kind of uh, sharing sharing things that have happened to me or. Um, 
just opinions on the golf. So we'll have to wait and see if that if that ever. I mean, I have a lot of people that ask me when I'm you know about about the book that I'm supposedly writing. Everybody says they've already written this book for me. You know, yeah. So I don't. You know, I I uh, I don't really think that that's there's too much interest really in that. I mean, everybody in this world has got a great story to share with everyone. Um, you know, I think it's about trying to find a way to to put it in a, in a positive light and to, to be able to help somebody, you know? So for right now, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still the assistant golf, uh, a volunteer assistant golf coach for the IUPUI Jaguars out of Indianapolis. And, um, so as far as the show, I don't, I don't know if someone, if someone's interested, <laughs> give them my phone number, my email address, I'll be happy to talk to them, but I enjoy it. I, I enjoy, I think it's easy for Chris, you and I to talk, you, you bounce ideas off of me and, and, uh, I'll, I'm always eager to answer. I don't really hold back too much as, as, you know, today maybe it's gotten a little bit, you know, off track, I suppose. Um, but I think just that's just culmination of just the frustration, um, and just kind of just the, the thoughts and feelings that I have right now, because I, I'd worked so hard in the summer to really had all these great things to look forward to in Reno and the PGA championship and beyond. And now that my year's over, I just am kind of in this funk that, you know, I don't really, I don't really have that, that goal. I, I went and practiced yesterday. I played, and I was just kind of walking around, you know, just didn't really have anything, you know, in the in the, in the short term to, to really to really focus on. So um, it's difficult. So I'm always eager to try to try new things, you know. So we'll see how that happens. Yeah. And to kind of get back to to your point a moment ago about, you know, the people that have been there, you know, supporting you and behind you um, along the way. Our, our next question is, have sponsors ever pressured you to play a particular ball or a club just so they could say you used it? Well, you know, there there is this kind of unwritten kind of thought out there that, <clears throat> you know, when a new product comes out, they'd love to try to get you into it. I mean, you can go down a list of guys and even watch guys today <clears throat> that are using balls. I know numerous guys that are using using a using a golf ball that was made eight years ago. Uh, I think they're trying to transition guys out of that, um, out of those types of things. But, yeah, it happens. When a company comes up with a new product and maybe you've been stuck in an old set of irons um, or an old driver or – uh, or golf ball, those types of things. Yeah, the new technologies, that's what they're trying to sell. And they need you out there using them, um, which is why they use that Daryl survey. Every week, you know, the Daryl survey people are out there. They're getting your equipment, what you're about to tee off with. And that stuff is all goes out. It's public somewhere. I, I don't know where the, where, where people would have access to it. They may, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just more for the manufacturers to see. And to and to basically make sure that you're using the product that you're, you're signed up to play for. What what's what's difficult I think is that, um, you know you you play uh, uh, you know you play a certain club, and um, you know you're with one company one year and you're you're basically allowed you're you're required to play eleven of the fourteen clubs. Then you go into another company maybe the next year or whatever, and they require you to play all fourteen clubs. And there are several companies that do that. You know, I believe Ping is one of them. And uh, and I think some of them have actually kind of uh, lightened their uh, restrictions a little bit um, in what you can play. But um, that becomes a challenge because then you then you have the golf equipment companies are not only are they saying that they're great at drivers, they're great at fairways, great at irons, great at wedges, but they're also great at putters too. So they, it, it, doesn't always, it doesn't always work that way. So I've never been – we all have things in our contract that we have to play certain clubs, certain numbers of clubs. But of course, everybody that comes out with something new wants you to play the new stuff. And, uh, but I've never been pressured to play, um, something new. I've, I basically, I remember, uh, you know, in 2010, I played very well with a golf ball and then come 2011, I couldn't get the ball anymore. And so I was left kind of searching, and that was frustrating um, to know that I couldn't I couldn't use the golf ball that I'd used in 2010. So um, mm. that's happened before. And what happens yeah. is companies will make product, and they'll say, "Look, this is the last. You know, we're not making this ball anymore. Here's 30 dozen balls, okay, or whatever it is. You keep them at your house, and every single week that you want to play, you have to travel with them. But we are not going to travel with them." And we're not gonna. You're not gonna have access to them on at the tournament sites. So you're gonna have to carry your own golf balls. Hey, some guys do that. 
Some guys don't. Some guys move into another ball. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's a lot of it's mental too. I mean, sure. But um, it, it's never happened to me where I've been forced to to do that. It's um, you know, I guess the golf ball situation, the example I just gave, is probably one of them. Um, although I did have the option to carry my own golf balls and, and use them, I just I just elected not to. Sean, one more before before we let you go. Our last question we'll we'll do this week is: What's the most nervous you've ever been on a golf course? Oh gosh, well, hmm, that's a tough one. I've been nervous quite a bit, and I think I think nerves are good. Um, I would say, you know, I would I would look back and and uh, look at the the, the PGA Championship and in 2003 i mean clearly um there were a lot of people that had written written me off you know they'd written me off friday night thinking there's no way i'm going to be able to hold the lead through saturday and then those people that well wow, he did it there's no way he can hold it through sunday i mean i was battling a lot of that um a lot of those those types of questions in the media center um on saturday friday and saturday night about a lot there were a lot of naysayers um and then, of course, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't, you know, won anything of any major significance on the PGA Tour, so I was battling that too. I was battling the major championship, but also trying to get my first win at that level. And so there, that, I remember teeing, teeing up on on the first hole on, on Oak Hill, and I, it was a three wood, and it was a dog, and it's a dog leg left, and I, wind, <laughs> wind is off to the left, and I've always had a very difficult time. And a right to left, a left to right wind into a right to left hole. Either I, either I pull, pull hook it, or I seem to block it out to the right. But I was, I was worried about that tee shot all morning, all night before. And um, you know, I just remember being able to tee the ball up and just announce my name. And I just, I, don't know, I just put the club behind the ball and I swung. I didn't even give it any thought. But I would say it was probably then. Um, Although there've been there've been a lot of there've been a lot of moments where I just felt like I couldn't couldn't tee the ball up, go back to Q school when I was first got my tour card. But clearly, I think you know the most that my mind really was ever worried about miss hitting just missing the ball completely was was on Sunday at Oak Hill. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a terrible it's, feeling. It's a terrible I thought. Bet. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it 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 happens out there. You know, people. You know, even Jason Day admitted to being nervous because you are playing for history. You know, you're playing for other people. You're playing for, you know, a big paycheck. You're paying for a big bonus check from your equipment companies, but you're also, and more importantly, you're playing for yourself and um, your ego. And to, to know that, you know, everybody, we all have one and whatever you do, we all think we can be great at it. Um, nobody wants to be written about as somebody that fell apart and choked and, and those types of things. And, so you battle these internal things and these thoughts that come into your head. Um, I've I've always kind of embraced them because they're the more that I try to make them go away, the more that, the more that they're there. You just got to try to find a way to put a positive spin on things um, and change it around. And you have to realize that hey, the other guys are just as nervous. Um, right. Maybe more so when you're actually leading because you've got no place to go but down. And so <laughs> I think a lot of guys really. I think there are a lot of people that do not like being the front runner. And then there are a lot of guys that prefer to be two or three shots back because if they don't win, ah, well, I wasn't winning anyway. You know, they can have this attitude. That's all ego driven. It absolutely 100% is. And, um, you know, it's, um, you know, I mean, how many years did Tiger, he never lost, hardly ever lost a major when he was winning and he, but right. he never won one when he was, when he was losing. I think Y.A. Yang was the only one that right. maybe beat him in a major when he, when he was winning one of the last days. So, right. um, you know, nerves are part of the game. Ego is part of the game. But um, we all have it. I mean, I remember David Faraday saying in, in one of his interviews, and I played with David some when I first got on tour, that they were talking about the butterflies, and he said he absolutely hated it. He said he, ever since he was a professional golfer, he hated that feeling of of having those nerves. And uh, if you have that feeling, you're not gonna you're not gonna succeed. And you're not gonna play. You're not gonna last very long in the game of golf. Right. Um, so you have to figure out a way to uh, to get through it and just think, hey, what's the worst thing that's going to happen to me? I don't win. Right. Uh, and and it's easier, easier to say as you're 46 years of age, too. 
<laughs> yeah, and I, I tell you one of, one of the things that I that I always liked about uh, Mr. Nicholas, and you know what a big Jack Nicholas fan I am, but he always yeah. used to say, you know, coming particularly coming into the the fourth round is when he'd walk around the locker room is, you know, they're all going to choke and I'm not, and that's how yeah. he won, you know, so often that he knew that uh, he he relished that time, while so many other point other players, to your point, David Faraday's, is that uh, most other guys didn't. It happens, you know, it really does. I, you think of about just a long list of guys that have played major championships that are, you know, that probably should have won a one or two by now that haven't done it. There's always there's always reasons. You know, either you get beat by a better player or you do something in the course of a round that, that maybe costs you the opportunity to win. Um, but it must be really fun to have that attitude when you walk into the locker room and know you're going to win and you know you're – because, look, you know, they talk about Tiger's career and, and things, and, and everybody's career comes to an end. Do you think Jack Nicklaus, if you took him out the whistling straights and you sat him down with all 156 guys and he just closed his eyes, he's like, I can beat every single one of you. But he what? He physically can't do it. But mentally he can because he knew if he had the game that he had in the 60s and 70s, he could. So right. that part of your game always – the physical part always leaves you. The mental part's always there. And for the guys that are, have reached number one in the world, have won as many majors, they're just mentally tougher than the rest of us. That's, I mean, because at our level, everybody hits the ball the same. Everybody hits the ball in the middle of the club base. Everybody knows how to add their yardage. Everybody knows which way the wind's blowing. So what separates? It's being able to, uh, you know, hit a shot under a, a pressure situation learning from experiences, knowing what the wind's doing, trusting your shot shape, those types of things, um, you know, and that's, that, that's usually what separates. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure that's exactly right. Sean, before we let you go, remind our listeners how they can follow you both online and over social media. Okay. So I'm at Sean McKeel PGA and, uh, and then Facebook, you can just find me Sean McKeel and, uh, you know, I'm there and getting a few questions from people. So I'm always, I'm always eager to answer, answer questions from, from anyone that wants to, wants to reach out. Uh, that's fantastic stuff. And we appreciate you coming here and doing it as often as you have. So uh, it's, you know, the relationship that we've established is, uh, is very important to me and one I'm very, very, very grateful for. So thank you for continuing to come on, can you come on the show, yeah. share your thoughts and feelings for you know, whatever those may be. And also answering our, our listeners' questions because it's uh, it's been really fantastic as having you as part of the show. Yeah, well, I, I, I enjoy doing it, and again, I'm always I'm always happy to answer anything. Um, you know, my my um, golf career is not just about the PGA Championship in '03, and uh, there's there's been a lot of tournaments I've played. I'm coming in on 400 PGA Tour events here before too long, so I've wow. a lot of tournaments. A lot of tournament golf to have been played um, on the PJ Tour, and um, people will always be critical of my success, um, you know, and uh, whether my career is, is worthy of a major championship. But the fact that I've been able to play nearly 400 golf tournaments on the PJ Tour um, shows that, uh, you know, I've got a lot of experience and have done a lot of great things in the game. So I'm, I'm proud right. of all those things. As you should be, and uh, to your point, having played in that many tour events uh, shows that you are much more than just a a one hit wonder or a, or the a 2003 PGA champion. You you know you you achieved a lot of great things and a lot more than uh, than uh, you know, any of us can say. So, congratulations to you for that. No, I, and you know, uh, it's, it's been great. Sure I don't know. think it's, it's not it's not over yet. I uh, still got a lot lot less to do and everything else. It's just. It's difficult. I'm in a difficult time right now because there's not a whole lot going on. We uh getting this chance to spend some time with my family, and I'm actually leaving here in a little bit to go watch my daughter play a soccer tournament in Jackson, Tennessee. So um, I'm getting to do all the great things. I think maybe in a way this is it just was just meant to be this way. So um, anyway, so I look forward to doing some of those things with them. Yeah, there you go. And we look forward to uh, getting to see you. You play a lot more golf in the rest of your, your golfing career. You, it's it's by far not over yet. So we look yep. forward to that, and we look forward to getting to talk more with you, Sean. Thank you for being here today. Sounds great. Sounds great, Chris. Thank you. Thanks to all the listeners. There you go. Take care, Sean. We'll, uh, we'll catch right. up soon. And in the meantime, all the best to you and your family. Thank you. You too, Chris. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. That is 2003 PGA champion, and uh, more importantly to that, what a great individual 
Sean McKeel is. So we can't thank him enough for continuing to be a part of the show. All right, folks, it is time for me to put a bow on this one. But before we close up shop, I want to remind you about the book that our friend Dave Stockton Jr. and his dad, Dave Stockton Sr., have put out there. You know it. It's called Own Your Own Game. And remember, folks, so much of the game, like Sean just talked about, is played between that five-inch space between our ears. So get your mind right. And this latest book, The Stocktons, lets you know how to use your mind to play winning golf. Own Your Own Game recreates the experience of riding 18 holes with Mr. Stockton at one of his highly sought-after corporate outings and draws from his experience as a champion player on both the regular tour, the Champions Tour, plus being a revered coach. So he shows you how to think better, stay calmer, execute more consistently, and more importantly, folks, how to enjoy the game more thoroughly. Go to StocktonGolf.com to get your copy, and for a couple of extra dollars, Mr. Stockton will even autograph it for you. All right, folks, my sincere thanks once again to Dave Harner, Mr. Ben Wright, and Sean McKeel for joining me today and making today's show so much fun to be a part of. And we thank you for tuning in and listening. We appreciate you guys the very most. Please also do me a favor. Check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, uh, with me and my co-host, Mr. Bob Lazar. You know our announcer, Joe LaGenusa. That show airs every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. You can hear us live on Blog Talk Radio as well as Armed Forces Radio as well. And you can also stream or download it at your convenience by going to iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player.fm and SoundCloud as well. Uh, plus, uh, you know, you can also hear us now, our, our good friends over in Audio Boom. Uh, we can't thank those guys enough for, uh, for featuring us every single week on their side as well. Plus, you know, do me a favor. Go to our Facebook pages. This, you know, this show next on the T or Thursday night tailgate. Give us a like and uh, share your comments with us. That's important to us too. Uh, and to remind you what Thursday night tailgate is all about. We uh, we talk to legends from around the NFL and CFL every single week. So great names, you know, from the history of the NFL and the CFL are there every single week from us. So please check us out. And you can check out either this show or that show online. You can find us this show next on the T dot net and Thursday night tailgate dot com. So you can stream or download any of our episodes, folks, our archive episodes for free. Plus you can keep up to date with who our future guests are going to be uh, on both shows by going to either one of those shows online. Again, next on the T.net, Thursday night, tailgate.com. Thanks folks. Once again, for choosing to listen to today's show, you know, we appreciate you guys the very most until next week. Hit them straight. My friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA legends, pros and top instructors, and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Saturday to hear more stories about the game we love from the people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game of golf.